You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 475 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I am Stephen Seagraves, joined this week by Mr. Fosma Mood. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm, I'm good. Yeah. It's evening where you are. It's middle of the day for me. Uh, and Seth is traveling. So it's just me. It's just, we're just going to have to make do. It might be a yeah. short show. Well, I mean, we can, I'm sure we can follow up sometime. I know we can't talk in that as we can, but. <laughs> He'd be the first to admit that, though. So. Yeah. Know thyself or something. <laughs> he owns it. He does own it. <laughs> um, so not a great week for Boeing, really. Um, so Calhoun, the CEO of Boeing, has basically said they can't find documents on the door plug that blew off the Alaska Airlines flight. So I think the NTSB had asked for documentation about who actually attached the door plug. Um, so, you know, was it Boeing? Was it Spirit, one of their contractors? Um, and that has not been provided. And Boeing is saying we don't know where it is. Well, and the irony with this is that an alleged whistleblower leaked a bunch of the documentation, or at least spoke of the documentation where it's documented, weeks yep. ago to AV Herald. Yeah. Which means that if they can suddenly not find it and someone has already said where it was and talked to it. That means it was likely destroyed. I mean, and why would you, I mean, I, I guess the question is, why would you, I mean, I know why you would destroy things, but destroying the documentation of just like who installed it seems kind of, I don't know, idiotic because all it says is who did the work. Right? Well, but you're assuming that's all it says. We don't know what else. We found, we, we found that the bolts were broken, but we put it in anyway. Like, I, ho- I hope that's not what it would say. Right, but we we don't know what was documented of the like something like you know this needs more work or this should have another check or who knows right yeah 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 there's a lot of things like we don't know what we don't know wow so I mean what do you what do you make of this is this Boeing I mean because it's not a good look for Boeing that there that this is happening I'm good look for off but I mean it's hard hey, look uh, one of our friends I happened to run into Australia a few month, weeks ago when I was down there and we were talking about some of the Boeing stuff and the, you know, the comment was the shit happens much more often than we realize. Yep. Right. There, there's all sorts of stuff that happens with airplanes that people don't know about and probably for the better. Uh, it's just now it's being brought into the limelight at this point. Now it's clearly highlighting a bigger systematic issue at Boeing, right? Boeing, when you looked at Boeing pre McDonnell Douglas merger, it was a very different mm-hmm. piece than post. And a lot of people have been saying that, the current issues with Boeing are all related to the McDonnell Douglas merger and the culture that it brought into the organization. Hmm. And that might be partially true. I think a part of the other issue at hand is what they call agency theory, which is the hyper focus on investor return over anything else. Yeah. Uh, this isn't giving, this isn't giving you investor return. That's for sure. But it did for how long? Oh, true. Right. The, a, lot the Boeing, got, a lot of people got wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. The Boeing McDonnell Douglas merger happened in what? 97, right? Or somewhere around there. And so people have made a lot of money on Boeing in the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, it was interesting. Um, I don't know if you saw, but in related to this, right? I think the first fallout is starting to happen in that there's now rumblings that UA has started, signed a lease agreement for 321s. Yeah. And there's, I mean... There's been some talk of their max 10 conversions because it's becoming, and we were going to talk about this a little bit later. I guess we can talk about it now, but United is changing some of their max 10s to convert it, convert them to max nines because they don't think the max 10 will be certified. Um, like and very, what, very unlikely. And what's Southwest going to do without the sevens? Uh, I think they're, they're really in a lot of trouble. Yeah. No, no, I mean, I don't think they're, I think saying they're in trouble is a, it's a, it's a bold statement, but it's, they're going to need to start replacing 73Gs at some point. And the Max 7 was going to be those replacements, and now you're not going to have those. So it's a hard pill for them to swallow. It is, but they could upgauge some of what they were going to do with the 7s, right? And they can get... Yeah, I mean, are there, if are there markets where they can't... Are there markets where they can't operate without a 73G? I'm sure some of the Burbank stuff, maybe? I don't know. I'm sure Burbank. Like, you don't have to fully load it. But remember, the Max has a lot, a lot more power than a 
seven. True, true. So, I was just thinking of hot and high places where they would want it. Uh, but I think a Max 8 can do any hot and high than a 7 can, simply because it's much more powerful. Oh, okay. And I and I don't have the definitive data, but my suspicion... I mean, the engines on the Max are far more powerful than what the 7s can do. And you can always approach it from a weight restriction standpoint to achieve what you need to. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, United kind of pulling back, going to A321s, converting their Max 9s, or Max 10s to Max 9s, uh, it's, it's not good. And on top of that... Um, some of the regulators have started talking about pulling Boeing certificates. Um, so I think EASA, which is the European um, kind of FAA equivalent, has talked about that they have considered um, basically stop, stopping to recognize the U.S. approvals um, that Boeing is built safe, to quote them. So they've, they're actually in consideration. That is very bad for Boeing. Yes. Well, I mean, but it's... It's not just bad for Boeing, it's bad for the U.S., right? But this this is what we get for letting Boeing dictate the terms. Yeah. Right. Like, this is the price they pay, and this is this is a problem they have created themselves. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one one area where I was I was wondering what Boeing would do would be, you know, how do they how do they kind of dig themselves out of this a bit? And to me, it says it means to me, it feels like what they should do is put their heads down and just start working the problem and making better airplanes that don't have as many big issues. Um, maybe that's a huge investment on their part, but at this point it's that, or everybody starts going to Airbus. So, uh, well, I don't know. Everyone can't, everyone can't go to Airbus. Just the reality. Right. Airbus just, well, because, because they're, because they're overextended with orders and things. Yeah. Yeah. They're overextended by orders. I mean, it just means we see older airplanes in the sky uh, for a longer period of time. But, I mean, there's a couple of things Boeing can do, right? Um, honest accountability. Like, not just as we took care of this kind of accountability, but actually take, taking out people who are responsible for the program. Now, wait, I'll be careful when you say taking out people, because, because a whistleblower <laughs> uh, allegedly committed suicide. Now, it's unclear, and, and well, I, I doubt we'll ever really know. Maybe we will. But he, you know, that he would, there's rumors that he was, you know, the conspiracy is he was killed by, you know, Boeing operatives or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, don't say, don't say take, 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 you know, take people out. Or, okay, <laughs> not in the way that he was taken out, but uh, allegedly. Um, no, but, but like removed from the company. Right? And yeah, that, well, they, and, and they need to be public, it needs to be publicly done, not behind closed doors. Yeah. yeah. And, right. This is the only way they're going to regain any level of trust. Um, cause it's like, it's, this is a twofold problem for them, right? It's not just the flying public, but at this point, the airlines have lost trust. Yeah. And Fair enough. That, that, that's like the only way you're going to redeem that yourself is by owning it, showing that you're taking proper corrective action and then, you know, demonstrating, continually demonstrating that repeatedly on a regular basis of how you're holding people accountable and what you're doing to make sure, um, things are being done properly. Yeah. 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 Make it a very make it very clear that you're making you're taking action basically. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh on that topic, no. I mean, I I, I sent you a picture to you that one of my friends sent me. Yeah, I I don't want to talk. Okay. <laughs> uh, the one thing I will say about the the foreign uh, regulators, their their main thing that they're saying is if more fatalities occur with Boeing, they will they will definitely pull the certificate. That's kind of their threat. But I, I don't even think that should be, it shouldn't depend on fatalities. It should be based on what is the status of the planes, right? If they're going through these planes and they're finding issues, mm -hmm. right? But I don't know that, I don't know that EASA actually goes through and certifies Boeing's. Like, I feel like they look at the U.S. and they say, okay, the U.S. has signed off on it. We'll, we'll absolutely, no. absolutely. But if the... EASA, the European-based operators, are going through their C&D checks and finding issues, and there's enough concerns. That should be a red flag. That should be like, yeah, they should pull it. Yeah. I wouldn't disagree with you. I mean, I think I think that's what the, that's their responsibility, right, is to yeah. say, look, you're not going to be able to operate this plane. And the, the odd thing is there aren't a ton of Boeing operators in Europe. Like right. K, KLM, Ryanair, uh, maybe Air Europa. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that's operating 737s. Does Turkish count? Yeah, I mean they are in Europe, so but would they even follow the rule? Like, would they follow the the recommendation from EASA? Probably not. 
No, but but it would impact them being able to find Europe as well as no, it's fair, 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 and Iceland Air, and Iceland. Oh, Iceland Air would be a big one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could have a big, it could have a big impact. So maybe Boeing should take heed and start making some changes sooner rather than later. Yeah, well, I, but here's the, my concern, right, in regards to the fatality uh, comment. The Alaska incident didn't have a fatality, but it was huge. Yeah, like that's what cracked this whole thing open. Yeah. So why should we? Why should we wait for a fatality? Yep. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Good points. Um, on top of that, like I want to talk a little bit about. So we talked about the Max conversions for United. Um, let's talk a little bit about the seven thirty seven because there was a panel. Uh, uh, it was a flight San Francisco to Medford. Um, a panel flew off. It was kind of like at the bottom rear. Um, uh, I guess underneath the wings, kind of a little bit, yeah. uh, and it fell off during flight, um, and no one noticed because it wasn't, it's not, it wasn't like a major piece of the plane that was critical to flight. But people are freaking out about it. I think the story. I mean, here's where it gets. This is where everything gets twisted, right? Everybody immediately turns to Boeing, and this is like a 20 year old plane that had this happen to it. Mm-hmm. It's not a, it's not a brand new plane. It, you, Boeing has zero responsibility for this. It's all United. And but and this isn't the first time we saw it. We saw the wheel come off the triple seven, uh, leaving San Francisco. We saw the plane that ran off the runway. Not th- those aren't Boeing problems, right? Like they're they were United problems. But everyone's interpret interpreting them as Boeing problems, and so it goes into the news cycle as a Boeing issue. Um, and that's not doing them any favors, but it's also kind of paints like a weird picture of like U.S. aviation in general. Like oh, it's so unsafe. And I don't think that's really the case either. I mean, it, it, okay, so what's the number of passengers in the sky at any given time or in the course of a month versus yeah. how many have get injured or die? Yeah, yeah. Right, like, it's just, like, I had someone ask me the other day, like, is it safe for them to fly? I'm like, look, like, you can't predict it. You can't predict anything. Right? But as a, when you look at it from a statistical standpoint, you're safer to doing that than getting in a car or in a bus. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And, I mean, and then... You brought up a great, a great, another story, LATAM. We've talked, we talked about it, uh, Seth and I talked about it last week, um, like kind of like right after it happened, um, a flight from Sydney to Auckland that was continuing on then to Santiago, Chile, and experienced a, a, a basically a dive mid-flight. Um, and now the reports are that that plane actually had an issue in the cockpit with the seat and something getting stuck, right? Isn't that... It wasn't that really- something got stuck. What I read was that there was a button that the yeah. flight attendant might have hit, which moved the seat. Oh, like rocker switches, right? Yes. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> so Boeing has issued an advisory for checking the buttons on the seat. And while Boeing did not say it was a result of the LATAM flight, the USFAA did say it was a result of that. And and again, like this goes down to there's a lot there's ADs issued all the time for advisories that are issued all the time across aircraft, across airlines. This happens day in and day out. He, AD being the airworthiness directive. Correct. And it's usually like something to check or to fix or to inspect. And for the most part, people don't know anything about it yep. as a passenger. But now that Boeing's in the limelight, everybody's hearing everything about every single incident. I mean, you're going to hit turbulence now. I feel like you're going to hear like a news it's gonna be on the front page. Yeah. And it's, it's Boeing's fault for not handling turbulence correctly. Or something I don't know, I, yeah. But the good news is, is that this it, this had an, it, this played out the way the Latam issue played out the way it should, right? Like, okay, we found a problem. Here's the AD. Get every you know, let everybody know about it. Check your check your cockpits for this and and move on. Well, yeah, I mean, but like, look, you can either sit here and blame Boeing, Boeing, but you can just as easily blame Airbus for other things. Like, think about the flight from Rio to uh, Paris, right? The because they're so computer dependent. It took it prioritized the co-pilots inputs over the pilots inputs, even though they were doing contradictory things, and didn't even attempt to fix that or warn them. Yeah, even though it was a known issue. Yeah, yeah, hmm. right. Like, like these things happen, and, and like you said, it's not always a loss of life, but people should take notice, and that's the point of the AD system and airlines following up. Now back to the United issue, it seems like it's an inspection issue, right? Like not properly inspecting the plane and having a panel fall off. I, I don't know if we can assume that just yet, because looking at the pictures, it looked like a panel broke somewhere because there was insulation dangling, not just mm-hmm. fell off. It wasn't the full panel. It was a part of a panel. We don't know if there was fatigue or something else on the panel. Yeah, but I still wouldn't blame Boeing for it. I wouldn't necessarily blame Boeing. 
but it, because it's, I mean, that was, I think a 738, right? So yeah, it, okay. it's a very old 738. Yeah. So it, it is probably something that was a panel that must have had some fatigue. My guess would be it had some fatigue on it and it just finally hit its breaking point. Unfortunate, but fortunately it was something that wasn't critical. Yeah. The question is, where's the other half of the panel? Yeah. No one's, no one's called it in. <laughs> like it, 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 I guess it didn't land on anyone's car this time, which is good. Like, like the wheel did. I, I think your comment was the best. Like, could you imagine coming home, going out to your car and be like, what happened? <laughs> oh, dude. Because it's back to the employee lot for the maintenance space. Yeah, you're like ready to go home. Yeah. You're at the end of your shift. You you, you bop out. <laughs> you've, had, you've, had a, you've had a long day. <laughs> or if you're, on the main, if you're at the maintenance space, right, like you see footage of what, uh, 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 undoubtedly, I'm sure you want to see the footage of it somewhere on TV and you're like, wait a minute. That's my car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or your wife sees it and then calls you, right? Like she's watching the news. Yeah. Do you see our car on the news? Wait, what? <laughs> oh, I feel bad for that person. But hopefully United Insurance will cover it. You think they, got, they have good coverage? I'm sure United will just let the person's insurance fight it out and get it. <laughs> I'm you. Oh, man. United will send an ETC on its merry way. Yeah, yeah. Here, Here's $200 for your next trip. Dollars? I'm thinking miles. Oh, two thousand. Here's two thousand miles. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for your flat tire. Here's two thousand miles. <laughs> no, my my car is flat. Well, you know, it, tomato, tomato. And here's another thousand. <laughs> um, let's talk about Global Crossing. So the former chief executive of Global Crossing is starting up an A220 low cost carrier. Um, Ed Ed Wiggle is the name of the the guy. And he wants to launch an airline called Airflow, and one I hate that name, but two, it's a it's they're going to be all A two twenties, and it's going to be I think it's going to be a low cost carrier the way I read it, um, and it was going to be Florida based. So you said the name, yeah, and the vision that I had was flow from the progressive commercials. Oh god, maybe maybe it is maybe it's a maybe it's a co branding deal. I feel like this has been done before. <laughs> Like well, first, where are all these two twenties coming from? Montreal, apparently Mirabel. But like, are there actually delivery slots available? Uh, that I don't know. Uh, right, because that, that that look look be real. Two twenty could be a good fit for a seven thirty seven seven hundred. Yeah, it's true. But do you really think Southwest is going to split up their fleet? You know, stranger things have happened. Right, yeah. if it if it comes down to passenger perception versus adding a new fleet type. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I mean, I'm trying to see if there's any lessors that are like clearly ordering. Um, looks like, well, Illusion isn't going to get any, uh, there's aviation capital group has 20 orders and they haven't taken delivery. Uh, air lease corporation has taken 15 of the 75, so maybe this this person's and that's Advar Hazy's group. So maybe this this new airline is going to get those deliveries. I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know to be honest, and I don't have sets of data to look at what's outstanding on the books. But um, I mean, they're being delivered. It, when I look at like delivery stats, um, there were in 2023 the 141 orders um, and 68 deliveries. So they're they're slowly upping the number of deliveries. Last in 2022, it was 68 or 53 were delivered. So they delivered 15 more planes in 2023. Um, so they're incrementally delivering more. But there is a total of 914 on order and only 322 of those have been delivered. So, so they, they have to be at full capacity. Yeah. So, like, wait, like again, so you start a new carrier. Like, when are you going to get your planes? Well, I mean, if he's if they're buying them or if they're leasing them from one of the lessors that has orders on the books, which is what I assume they're doing, then whenever that lessor gets them, unless the lessor's planes are already committed, could be, right? Like, yeah. Air Canada's buying a bunch of them, right? They're they're uh, leaning in towards the on those. Delta's clearly been leaning on them. JetBlue now, yeah. Um, it's like, are they re- are they really are they committed or are they not committed? Is the question, and that, that's an answer we don't know yet. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I mean, to give you an idea, there's you know Odyssey Airlines is a startup airline with a planned base in London City, and they have ten of them on order, and they were supposed to start getting them in 2020, and they haven't gotten those yet. So that tells you everything. 
Exactly. And who knows? Maybe they've, you know, I don't know anything about Odyssey, but maybe they've delayed them. I don't know. So, um, yeah, I, it's, I don't, I don't know that just not speaking of a two twenties, but I, I don't know that is there really space for another low cost carrier that is based in Florida. I mean, breeze is struggling. We've seen that. I think it depends where in Florida you base yourself. Orlando. Well, that we cranky did a great article on that, right? That that is that market seems to finally be tapped out. Yeah. So I guess maybe you go Tampa, Miami. I don't know. Not Miami. Uh, Lauderdale. Uh, Fort Lauderdale's pretty full too, but Tampa, like the west coast of Florida is recently empty, right? Fair. Right? Like what I think one of the peers at Tampa is still a mothball. Really? Yeah. Huh. Did not know that. Yeah, I don't I, I could be wrong, but I mean, it was a very large airport. I remember being there years ago, and like two of the piers back then were mothballed. I think they've since opened at least one of them and rebuilt some of them, but there might still be a pier that's mothballed out there. <laughs> can, can we brief? I want to take a brief pause and talk about Orlando. What are they thinking with the security setup there? Like, it might be the most asinine security setup no. I have, I've ever seen. Denver's worse. Well, Denver's worse because it's just too many people. But the idea, so for those who don't know, when you go through Orlando, it's in a, the central, it's the main building, right? There's And there's like a north or, or east and west side of the security. And I don't think it matters which one you go through. The, set, the it setup does. is this, it does? Well, it was, excuse me, the two are the same. So basically you have to pick on what side of the airport you need to be on. Right? Yes. So they're on each side, there's two piers. And this is not excluding the E pier, the new terminal. Yeah, but it's... But it's set up like they're set up similarly, right? Like, so yeah. I'm guessing the setup isn't very different between the two. So you you go, let's say you're in pre-check and you're like, okay, I have pre-check. You go to, there's like seven lines of pre-check and you're like, okay, this makes sense. I'll just pick a line that looks short. So you pick a line and then you get to the front and you realize there's only three agents at the front and they're randomly choosing which line the person comes from that they check the ID for. What idiot thought this was a good idea? Because... The person, the person doing the ID checking, is not tracking which line that they they chose clearly. Because I had a coworker, we both were about seven people back uh, in two different lines. He made it through a full ten minutes before me. That's how slow my line was moving because I never got picked. They were just like skipping our line, and I'm like, this is this is dumb. Like it would be one thing if it was like a gate that like opened automatically, like it was like okay, the person hit a button and it like went to the next person, but it doesn't do that. They just got a point. You know, this it's asinine, just asinine. So if you're gonna go through there, use clear. Well, clear has its own issues. Because then at least you'll jump the line. <laughs> or, or better yet, just fly to Tampa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, when did Chili's become so bad? I think it's always been bad. I think <laughs> your taste buds have just evolved. Probably. I I went so we went to the I was my coworker and I were like looking for somewhere to eat and we're like let's just eat at Chili's because I need something that's semi fast and. uh so we ate there, and then I didn't realize their menu had just been cut in. I mean, there's like ten things total well, on the menu. It's probably an airport menu. True, but it's even it's small for even an airport menu. I would. It's mostly just like quickly fried things, which I think is the point. So, anyway, it yeah. So all right, I'm back. I'll get back on topic. I'm sorry. Apologize. Um, what else? I was going to ask you something else. Oh, I had some follow up about Mexico City. I think Tony, who's a Patreon subscriber, and left a comment. He was talking about Seth and I were talking about Mexico City. Uh, to, I believe, Shenzhen. Um, and there's an airline starting that up. And one of the comments t- Tony was saying, oh, well, you know, flights have always stopped. And I think I think Seth merely misspoke, saying, you know, this hasn't existed before. We we knew that the, you know, ANA and the Aeromexico flight had existed going via Tijuana, and this flight's doing the same thing. Our point was more, you know, these flights still can't make it nonstop to Mexico City um, or from Mexico City uh, in this case. So they, they stop at Tijuana. And I think that that limitation, I think they looked, you know, this Shenzhen flight uh, actually looked probably and they said, we it, for us to go via the U.S., it's probably just easier for us to always go via Tijuana either way. Um, and so I think that's kind of the reason for it. So I just wanted to respond to Tony's comment before I forgot. So we yeah, we agree with you, Tony, completely. Um, let's talk about Frontier and their Upfront Plus. So they are kind of like implementing uh, Eurobiz for their flights and they tried this during COVID and I don't think it worked particularly well. Um, so this is basically like a blocked middle um, and it'll be like $50 starting at $49 a flight. Um, 
I I don't know what I think about this. Like, maybe it works out for him. I guess you're paying to have a seat fly empty. Wouldn't this, it be better? This tells me that they're not filling their planes. Yeah, and they're like, we can just have seats we, we can let go empty and just make a little extra cash. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you get extra leg room. Uh, it's basically the first two rows. So they're not even committing a bunch of seats to this. It's, that's first two rows before seats. But they're talking about like Eurobiz where it moves depending on the flight. You would think you would think that's how they would they would do this, uh, but then they, I guess they don't want to give the flight attendants more work or something to move the little the, the little curtain thing. It's not even a curtain now. It's like a little. It's not even. It's like a little icon that they put in in the pen, <laughs> the closet, like the little piece of cloth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's like a flag to let people know. Hey, um, yeah. But they're not doing that. And then they're gonna have premium, and that's just extra leg room and comfort. So I'm guessing that's still at the front, or maybe it's anywhere, but it's anywhere with extra leg room and then they're going to have preferred which is just seats closer to the front of the, the aircraft and then they're standard i yeah for, it's four seats and you're going to pay 50 bucks to have that extra middle seat that extra seat in between you i guess it could be worth it i'd be interested to hear what ed our friend ed thinks well here's my question if it's one of these ultra cheap routes wouldn't it be cheaper to buy the seat for 19 dollars mm, good point because you can always buy two seats yeah yeah <laughs> Does United? I mean, United still lets you do that, right? Yeah, but you can't earn miles on both. Oh, darn! I awesome. know. <laughs> Trust me, I know. I mean, I think. I mean, that's really. Uh, that's what I would do. I mean, and, and maybe Ed has already thought of that. Like he's been doing the math behind the scenes. Tell why stop at two and buy three? Buy the whole row. Yeah, still cheaper. Yeah, and for Ed, he said he's got some non-stops that he could take where he's at. I question it. I question it. I can take a bunch of non-stops on a trend. That doesn't mean I'm doing it. I question Ed's sanity. Um, yeah. So anyway, interesting stuff. And then lastly, um, Embraer, the E2, which is the E190 E2 and the E190 E2 or E195 E2, has now been uh, certified for 120-minute ETOPS, so extended twin engine operations, um, which is, I think it's a kind of a big deal because it allows the plane to fly over water or less... Um, populated areas without divert like with 120 minute diversion times so there's some routes that they were having to avoid and i think this gets around some of those uh, i think i mean that'll be big in the caribbean yeah i mean i think it's a, it's a big deal i mean and probably something that jet blue would take advantage of i would think i don't think jet blue has the ability to really uh no they really can't right now well fair enough I, I think they have enough problems at home before the, you, they try to go back to the 190s well, I mean, if they don't they have E twos? No, no, they have the all, they have all two twenties now. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I was thinking, yeah, but it could help. I think there's like bah- Bahamian Air or there's some, there's some carrier. I mean, Delta. It'll help Delta for sure, right? Uh, Delta. I mean, there will be a bunch of carriers, but this could also be an opportunity for Southwestern get right. Uh, do you think they're going to take E twos? I don't know why I said Delta. Delta doesn't have E twos either, so I don't know who has E twos. Look, at the end of the day, if Boeing can't make reliable planes and with delivery times that people need, and Airbus can't deliver anything sooner, people are going to start looking at some of these other options. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. I'll try to see who else has Porter has them, so that would help. It'll help Porter. Porter, who has them but doesn't know what to really do with them. Uh, and then I'm guessing this the one who this really helps is Azul Brazilian Airlines, um, because they could fly some of the more remote routes. I think uh, at 120. Yeah, uh, probably some of that probably going over the Amazon in some areas. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, and then Widero, which I don't think Widero is using them necessarily anywhere that would need them, need the 120. Anyway, it's good. It's piece of news, little nugget for today. Um, for our bonus topics, we're going to talk about Built, uh, the, the renter's card, and then we're going to talk about Alaska award changes, and then anything that you want to talk about. Foz, and that's for our Patreon subscribers. So for them, stick around, and we'll uh, talk to you in the bonus show. Uh, for our regular listeners, thank you for, for listening. We appreciate it, and uh, we will talk to you next time. Happy travels. Take care.